speak to us, Lord, and how you just pour out your love on us. We love you because it's Jesus. We are so thankful for you, God. I just thank you, God, for what you're doing here tonight, Lord. You've already begun. God, we just ask for more. Lord, you're transforming and changing our hearts, God. So, Lord, I just thank you. take over a lot of the time, but I'm on staff at Youth for Christ, and um, my passion in life is, is hanging out with teen moms, and so um, I am blessed that God allows me to do that, and I get to do a lot of it here, a lot of it in that North Big Church that I get lost in. So um, I wanted to know where you were as a community and to see where Pastor Phil had taken you, so I went online to that. You guys have a lot of resources online. That's crazy. I had no idea. So I watched uh, Jean do. I say Eugene because I do a background check and I put full name on you, but I guess it's Jean. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's another one of my duties at Youth for Christ. So, uh, and I, I listened to Pastor Phil talk about reconciliation and he defined forgiveness for those of you that were here really, really well. So I'm not, I'm not going to duplicate that, but I was excited by it um, because it was right along the lines that the Holy Spirit has led me to talk tonight. I, um, I know this subject intimately. And um, my kids have heard me talk about it. I, we explore it with the young women we get to spend time with. And um, I'm excited to be here tonight to talk to you about it. But anyway, I went online. I watched how you all operate during service. And uh, this little room is louder than our big, humongous church mm -hmm. when people are, are sharing a message. So I'm excited and a little frightened of that. <laughs> uh, we might once in a while get an amen thrown out there, and then that person is kind of like, shush. So, uh, so bear with me if I look stunned, if any of you, you know, respond in any way that moves you, I will try to be okay. <laughs> So, the thing about forgiveness is that um, it causes people to get a little stressed out when we talk about it. And I think that's cool, because anything that makes us uncomfortable will make us grow. Amen. And so, good, you bring that <laughs> So, people are often hurt by the ones that they love, right? Like, the people that you love have that ability more than anyone. Maybe it's uh, the people that created you. I mean, how many of us just are wrecked by those people that created us, that have that authority over us? Um, we are hurt by people that we choose to give our hearts to, by our friends. Some of you, if you're in this small, tiny church, maybe you're here because you have been hurt by a church. And something like this was really appealing to you, a church that goes into their community so boldly Come and tackles on. things like reconciliation and forgiveness. So I, um, I can only imagine that some of that is led by a hurt. Jesus himself was hurt by his disciples. He's God, he's here as human, but it spent a lot of time in Scripture talking about how he was hurt, right? My story isn't that uncommon. Um, I Sadly, it wasn't that uncommon. I was not raised with my dad. My dad was not around. He bolted when I was about one. He, um, he chose alcohol and drugs over me and my mom. They were a young married couple. They themselves teen parents. Um, I didn't have that protection of a father. In fact, everything that happened to me when I was young, I angrily blamed on my dad not being there. If something didn't go right or whatever, in the back of my head, I thought, well, if I had someone who loved me that way, who was watching out for our family, maybe my mom wouldn't struggle the way she did. Maybe we wouldn't be opened up to predators. And so that's another part of my story, is that in that, in that place of trying to just get by, my mom trusted the wrong people. 
-hmm. So when I was four until about age 11, someone very dear to me, someone who I adored, took innocence away from me. And we had a room, and, and I don't ever like to say the word specifically, but I think you all get what I mean, right? Innocence is so important, especially now. Children don't have it. And, um, and I believe that my dad not being there uh, opened up that door, and that predator came into my life. I also know that by sheer numbers, and I say this often when I talk, uh, that the number of people in this room who've been affected that way is so high. In this small room, the percentage doesn't change whether it's in this building or my North Fresno church. And so my dad became sober, uh, finally, because one night uh, he nearly killed a family here in Fresno. He was driving, uh, he was drunk, and he was high. And uh, this had been a long road. I was in my very early 20s. Um, I'm older now. And uh, <laughs> my dad smashed into a family, almost killed them. He spent a little bit of time getting put back together, and then they sent him to jail. And uh, my dad got sober at the Salvation Army. None of us would return his phone calls. None of us would help him. My grandpa refused to send him to rehab for the gazillionth time, spending thousands of dollars. So anytime I see Salvation Army, I'm just wrecked. And it opened up, I think, an early planning for me on um, caring for a community with an organization that just, that just loves being out in the community. And so Salvation Army, to me, will always be special. So the thing that caused my dad to be sober was that he almost killed a family. In the years, very few of them that we had together, about five years, uh, and he had sought reconciliation with me. We really explored forgiveness. And um, I started to hate the word. I wasn't a believer. Um, and when my dad spoke about forgiveness, it was about how Jesus had forgiven him. It really did for me. And I remember thinking at the time, how convenient that he wants me to understand that above everything else. Mm. And so I felt uh, a struggle and wanting to please my dad and to follow his God. Um, but I also had a, really, a, a real desire you know, to change my life. That desire that we have to please a father, I believe is a gift, and many of you believe this way too, that God gives us is the desire to please our heavenly father. Amen. And I didn't know it. Um, there's a, a resistance that happens when we are told to forgive, right? You think, no can't possibly expect me to forgive this. Or maybe those of you that have hurt many people through any route, you think that they could never possibly forgive you. And then you take it up higher to a God that maybe we see as a judge, someone who looks down on us, has this book with all these rules in it, and we think that he could never possibly, because if he sees us, what he sees can be disgusting. And how could he forgive us? So there's a resistance that happens there. But I'm comforted, because I kind of talk backwards. I think sometimes I could probably talk like Yoda, and my husband uh, stares at me often like I do. I feel like <laughs> the fact that I can uh, stand up here and talk to you, this group or any size group I've ever talked to, is, <laughs> is Jesus, because um, my tongue gets tied. But sometimes to say what something is, we have to say what it is not. And I, forget, I, I figure that when I talk about forgiveness, it's easier for me to say what it isn't. <laughs> right? I think it also gives me a better path to you. And so this journey that I've been on exploring forgiveness and thinking it's an ugly word uh, starts with saying that forgiveness does not say that it was okay, whatever happened to you. You were wronged. You were hurt. You were neglected. You were abused. You made mistakes. It doesn't say that it is okay. It does. And to someone like me, this is important. It does not deny that something bad happened to you. It doesn't take that away. That thing that happened to you might be what God somehow later builds your whole life upon. And sometimes I'm a little curious about why he allows that to be in our life. But Forgiveness does not define your relationship status. When I originally have talked about this, I talked more from a social media standpoint, right? You know, we get on there, right, how we're feeling. And that's really the angle, but I left it today because I think that um, sometimes that means that we think that if I forgive them, I have to hang out with them. Uh -huh. And so if I were to repeat the cool five things that, that Pastor Phil said to you last week, a lot of them have words about forgiveness like dismiss or release. Release from moral obligation or legal obligation to move away from without implication, causing separation. Mm 
To have something continue or remain in place. Leave standing, lying without concern to oneself for it, right? To convey a sense of distancing. All of those ideas about defining your relationship status can make us a little bit nervous because it makes you think that that person has to come back into your life. In my life, because as a result of my father abandoning me, my dad became sober as a result of a horrible accident. My dad, ironically, was hit by a drunk driver and he was put into a coma. Um, my dad lived that way for nine months. And I'm gonna go ahead and say that I begged every day. And I pleaded and I made uh, arrangements. Do you all make arrangements with him? Like, Amen. If, Come on. if this happens, I will Come do on. this. Or Come I on. promise I'll give that up if you just, I said I'll take my sons to church. I was a single mom. One of my boys are here today. Amen. And I used to just beg and plead. I think of the fact that I hated forgiveness and how God was going to throw it back on my face later. And so I, um, something happens, right, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life and you experience it, transforms your heart, kind of messes you up a bit. So I forgave, I forgave my uncle. I forgave my father. But I forgave my uncle for what he did to me. So much so that a few years ago, and I want to talk about the relationship status for a second because I think I skipped over it. I forgave my uncle, but I do not have a relationship with him. I loved this person, sure. and he ruined parts sure. of me that only God healed later in my marriage, and I am so grateful for that. But um, we have no relationship. However, a few years ago, my mother, who cautiously talks about him sometimes around me, kind of updated me with him. And he was unwilling to step out and seek Jesus because of what he had done to me. Mm -hmm. And he was suffering with alcoholism and some other issues. And I one day called my mom, who I had chewed out several times for being nice to him. And I called my mom and said, uh, can I have his number? I don't say his name, but I don't need to. And she paused and kind of freaked out a little bit and mm -hmm. she gave it to me hesitantly. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, she gave me the wrong number, so I had to call her back. And say that's cute. Can you give me his real number? <laughs> so I called and said, I will never be the reason that someone doesn't seek Jesus. It will mm. never ever happen if I can control it. So I have a good life. I have a husband. I have beautiful children. I know the Lord. And if you know the Lord the way I know the Lord, I'm not going to get in the way of that. So I have forgiven you. I forgave you a long time ago. I don't want to hear your voice. Please don't talk to me. But I want to say I released that. And I am not mm. the burden that you get to carry because I am good and I am free. Amen. Come on. sinned and chewed my mom out because she takes the abuse from me over and over again. <coughs> so I ask my mom's forgiveness a lot for dumping on her. But um, I forgave my father, and here's why. My dad displayed a selfless craziness about making me understand um, reconciliation. He humbled himself in crazy ways, went I through temper tantrums, and I revisited things. Um, he decided he was going to pay for my therapy, but that was going to be it. So every Tuesday, I was I worked for my dad down here downtown here in an insurance office, and every Tuesday I would go and I would get help, and I would leave there raw and angry and no solution. But I was talking through things for the first time in my life. I was 20 something at this point, and every Tuesday I would come back to the office and I would slam things around and I would answer the phone a little unprofessional and I was kind of a mess. And he just took it all the time. He represented reconciliation to God, to me, to his family, and to the people he nearly killed. When my father died, that woman was at his funeral, mm. praising the steps he amends that he made to her. And if any of you have ever worked a 12-step program, um, you understand that you make amends at, one, at some point. And so it was amazing to see people there excited about the fact that he was now eternally with Jesus and not angry for the years that he had hurt them or money he had taken from them in his addiction. And the last thing about forgiveness is that it doesn't erase the pain. It may return to you. In fact, that's a tool the devil's going to use. Mm -hmm. You're going to think that you're too good to forgive. And so we're going to go to his word in a minute because it's way better than my word. Um, you may never forget. It can create, um, but it can create positive boundaries in your life. 
My husband and I share a childhood that's very similar. Our hurts are similar. We understand one another. We are careful with one another, especially in the middle of the night. I'm not a fan of being woken up in the middle of the night a certain way. I cannot handle it. But the way we are with our children, the boundaries, the rules, let's not ask these three people about where they're allowed to spend the night. So even though I don't forget, it's helped me create excellent boundaries. My children understand it. So I accept that. I'm okay with it. My head is not buried. Uh, you may still get angry. Uh, anger's not a sin. Come on. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right. It can be softened. It should be softened. Okay, so scripture says it better than I do. So I want to go to uh, Matthew. Matthew 18. I'm reading NIV. I don't, it's what I learned. I became a Christian later in life as my father was dying, and it's my comfort. So I'm in another version of the room. But. So, this is the parable of the unmerciful servant. Jesus taught this way. A lot of red letters in here, so when Jesus talks, we know it's awesome. <laughs> the Bible is red, right? So, Jewish tradition at the time about forgiveness was that you didn't have to really forgive anybody over three times. Like, they wronged you once, okay. one more time, and the third time you kind of got like a social rule, like, eh, I don't have to forgive him anymore. Right? So that's kind of what was going on with that at the time in the Jewish culture. Um, so this also tells the nature of God, what he expects from us, that it, forgiveness is not relative to whatever the situation is. Thank you. So I'm just going to start. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? He thought he was going big when he said this, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's why he wore a t-shirt. 75, 7. Okay. My daughter's on it. It's a little cheesy, but my girls told me to wear it. Some of you. Do it on kids. And he says to him, up to seven times? Because he's going to impress Jesus. Seven times seven. Thank you. Jesus answered, I tell you. I love it. I tell you. Not seven times, but 70 times seven. Seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. So he's telling the story. As he began to settle the settlements, a man who owed him 10,000 talents, it's a lot of money. It's like, you can't really be paid back. It's not a few dollars. It's not even like a year's income. It's a lot of money. And I'm sure there's some Bible scholars in the room. God bless you all for knowing that exact amount. You can tell me later. I don't know it. I can be 10 in the letters after I find out, but it is a crap load of money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, who owed him 10,000 talents and was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had sold had to be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant, that same forgiving guy, mm -hmm. the guy who just, an amount he could never pay back, his wife and kids were about to be sold. Mm -hmm. That same guy. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. This isn't a lot of money. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailer to be tortured until he could pay back all that he owed. This part has always confused me a bit because if you're being tortured in a jail cell, I don't know how you're paying people back. But <laughs> <laughs> so Jesus gets serious at the end of this, right? He wants you to understand this is the nature of God. It's not relative. We are forgiven people, but we are often unforgiving, and this is how we see that it is a command. This is how my Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Right? It's the, not whether you took something from me. Okay. Where the confusion part is, is yeah. basically, I, I'm going to, I'm only two years. I spent time in prison too. I'm going to be honest with you. 
And like I said earlier, I stumbled upon the church two years ago when I was homeless. And now I'm upon this church. That's why I asked for prayer out because I'm going to Modesto because I, I become a reverend doctor. No psychology now I'm going for my other doctor degree. Now, the forgiveness. I'm going to forgive you for interrupting me, but I'm headed somewhere and I want to get That's right. Yeah. 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 But I'm not done, so I'm here after. Yeah. Well, I'm okay. Are we good? Did you forgive me for saying forgive you? Yeah. <laughs> that was a little manipulation with the word. I don't want to use Jesus' word in the wrong way, so. <laughs> okay. I don't have to talk too much. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, start my life. Forgiveness is. I have the things from pa uh, Pastor Phil that he said forgiveness is, and I'm in agreement with that, and I think it's rad. But I'm going to keep these simple. Forgiveness is freedom. It's moving on. It's a release. The most important thing about forgiveness is not the final thing, but it is obedience. It is uh, not easy. I don't think a lot of the things that he asks us to do, but it is obedient. Obedience, and this is something that my my husband and I discussed for a little bit tonight. It is continual, a way of life, but it, it is an instruction. You might blow it the first time you try it. You might, you might throw it back at them what they did as you're telling them that you forgave them. It's a good try. Mm. It's a good start. Might not work. Might not work. Ouch. It's not the right intent, but that's what we do, right? Come on. I'm sorry you made me so angry. That's my favorite. Right? Okay, when you love someone, you want to please them. And so I told you that I was trying to please my dad, who really I should have been trying to please a Heavenly Father. And so when we know the nature of God and we know His plans for us and we have a relationship with Him and we invite the Holy Spirit in, we want to please Him. So instead of being using my relationship with God as a bargaining tool, I saw it as a doorway for the Holy Spirit to come in and transform me. I started to explore the implications of the cross, that he died for our sins. Do we consider that some of the last words that he spoke were asking God to forgive the people who were killing him? As yeah. he was dying, yeah. several of the things that he uttered, one of them was forgive them yeah. on the cross. So the implications of the cross. Right. So we are forgiven, but we are often unforgiving. We are created by a God who understands our innermost pieces. So he knows what he's asking us to do, right? He understands that. He knows we've got arguments in our head. He made us think this way. He understands there are things to overcome, and we, we still have to do it anyway. We have to choose to be obedient to it. We get to choose to forgive because Jesus modeled it when he was a human. Not just as God, not just as when he came back but that he modeled it while he was here in flesh with the desires when he begged his father not to take his life. So, before we finish up, it's not lost on me that a lot of you are going to return maybe to a house where you're not treated well or to a relationship where you're disrespected. Um, you're going to go back to your lives where there are hurts. And so I just want to challenge you to consider it. The things that forgiveness isn't and when the arguments come to you when you're unable to do it, realize he did it in his human form. Mm -hmm. That he modeled it for us. It's an instruction. And it's an obedient act. It struck me all week that we are forgiven, but we remain unforgiving. Mm. And I think that that's really the thing we'll take away. So tonight, which I think is so beautiful, you have um, stations here, right? And I don't really get to experience that where I'm from, but something really cool. My partner in crime, Jenny, is here tonight, and we had the pleasure of going up to Hume Lake with a bunch of mommies and their babies. Uh, Hume takes really good care of us, and we go up there, and it's a weekend where girls get to unpack a bunch of stuff, mm -hmm. and we realize that young people, old people, we all have things that we want to forgive. So for our stations tonight, we have, um, which most of you are familiar with, and if you have questions about that, there are people here to help you with the whole life giving part. Um, but you will be off, there's communion station, and um, over here, though, is what we did up at camp. And so that paper is really awesome. It's kind of magic. It, as soon as you place it in the water, it just evaporates. And so after you spend a little time, maybe there's somebody that you'd like to forgive. Uh, maybe there's somebody that you would like to not forgive, but you're going to do it anyway. Um, maybe you need to forgive yourself. Maybe you need to, like me, forgive God. 
I ultimately had to forgive God, and that sounds blasphemous to me now, but I had to do it first. And so you're able to write on that piece of paper. It's not a big piece. Um, then you place it in the water, and it just kind of swirls away. We actually have really cool stories of girls watching a person's name swirl away and disappear. And it's, that's how fast and immediate the forgiveness of Christ is, right? Yes. And so we, it's a really cool thing that we get to do today.